Hello everyone, we're continuing our study on the book of Proverbs. And so let me encourage you to get your Bibles out and join me today as we look at chapter 2 of Proverbs. Proverbs is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and it's sometimes overlooked. And yet it's such a practical book. In chapter 1, it starts off with a case for wisdom. Why we need wisdom. We should desire wisdom. The value of wisdom, the ability to see that today's choices will affect our future. That's what wisdom is all about. Being able to make a choice today, knowing how it will affect our future. And so we all need this kind of wisdom. One of the biggest problems today is that people's lives are in messes because they continue to make choices, not recognizing just what they'll do to their life in the future. And so Proverbs is, is so important. It begins, of course, in chapter 1, verse 7, focusing on God. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. The relationship we have with God. Some people haven't found skillful living, haven't found wisdom because they reject God. And God is so important in how we make our choices each day. And so Proverbs keeps us in focus for us. It, it helps us see the importance of of making good decisions today. Chapter 2 begins in verse 1 by saying, My son. My son. That, that's important for us to, to see this. My son. Because it reminds us of the parental responsibility to teach our kids wisdom. The, the father is so important here. Solomon's the author. Solomon is talking to his sons. Fathers, you need to talk to your kids, your sons, especially about wisdom. Mothers are important here, too. We've seen back in chapter 1, verse 8. Mothers and fathers are both so valuable in teaching wisdom. It's our responsibility as parents. You know, one of the big problems I see today, you know, I have a few school teachers in my life, and one of the problems that we see in the schools is that parents have given up their responsibility. They've given it over to the school. Uh, it's our responsibility to teach our kids. I remember going to many teacher conferences reminding the teachers that I'm responsible for teaching my kids and I'm so thankful that they're helping me out in this. If you give it over to the schools and you blame the schools for every problem your kids have, you blame the schools for this and that, and that's what we see happening today. The teachers are getting blamed and the kids are not being disciplined, they're not being taught wisdom in the homes and it's causing so many problems. Uh, we see the death of wisdom in our culture we also see the death of parental responsibility. And both of those things seem to go hand in hand. And so Proverbs is emphasizing the need for parental guidance, especially for dads. You know, dad, your son needs you to teach them wisdom. Your children need you to teach them wisdom. I read a phrase once that said, as fathers go, so goes the nation. As fathers go, so goes generations. As fathers go, so goes history. Now, that's not to diminish the importance of mothers at all. It's just to say that dads, we oftentimes give up our, our roles as a teacher, as the one who teaches our kids wisdom. And, and we cannot abandon this role. If there's trouble in our country today, I think it begins with dads. I mean, they tell us that almost 40% or almost 50% of our, our kids are living at homes without their fathers. I mean, there's been some bad decisions made along the line for sure. But dads, you have a responsibility to your kids. The, the main duty of, your, of a father is not just to bring home the bacon or, or to provide a living or to take out the trash. It, it is to teach your kids. Uh, teach them wisdom. Uh, and what's required for a parent to teach wisdom? Well, as I said last time, well, you have to acquire a little bit of wisdom yourself. It's time to grow up. It's time to put childish things away. And so often we see parents who have refused to do that. I remember going to teacher conferences and I apologized to my kids when I got back because I thought if the parents behave this way, no telling how their kids are behaving at school. So many parents have refused to grow up. They have refused to see the need for wisdom. And so this is an important book. I, I, like, I like Proverbs. Uh, teach wisdom. Take a stand. Who your kids are going to become begins with you. 
Uh, sometimes we say, well, you know, the, the major problems, some people say hey, most of the problems teens have today are parental problems. I don't know if I want to go that far, but many of their problems are parental problems. And so it's not only a need for our, us as parents to take a stand and teach wisdom, but it also have to emphasize to our kids, you got to take a stand too. You got to desire wisdom as well. You've got to do it as well. Um, and so, a failure to see how today's choices will affect tomorrow <laughs> is a big problem. You know, if I only knew when I was 19 what I would be like today, maybe I would have taken better care of myself when I was 19. How many times we hear people say that? I remember when I was 29 years old, I said that to myself. I was 29 years old and I thought, wow, if I knew at 19 what I look like now. You know, that year when I was 29 years old was a year of many changes. I lost 30 pounds that year. I started eating right. I started exercising regularly. I started recognizing that, man, the decisions I'm making right now are really going to affect my future. You want your kids to know this lesson early in life. If they knew at 12 years old what they'd be like at 18, maybe they could start making these decisions earlier. You see, these decisions are so important. And so as we look at Proverbs, I think Solomon's asking, am I speaking to fools or am I speaking to wise people? Fools say, you know, I've, I'm wise enough. I've, I've got it all down. I'm doing just perfect. The wise person says, I could always do better. And so I want to acquire wisdom. And so here what we get seeing is the urgency of wisdom. And so let's take a look in, in chapter 2. Let's read this together. He says, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, and if, for if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. <laughs> Did you notice all the ifs there? If, if, if. If you'll listen to this message, then you'll get results. If you search for wisdom, search for wisdom as you would seek for a hidden treasure. I'm one of those garage sale junkies. I like to go to garage sales. I'm always looking for that, that hidden treasure. Uh, you know, going out and finding a treasure, you know, using a metal detector and finding treasure has built a lot of people. And, uh, you know, finding a treasure, how hard is it to find a hidden treasure? You know, most of the people that went to California during the gold rush never struck it rich. Most of those who went to the Klondike looking for gold never found gold. It is hard to find hidden treasure. But it's not hard to find wisdom. He just says, seek for it as if you were looking for a hidden treasure. Use some diligence. Have some desire. Put some effort into it. Because then you'll find it. And God will give it to you. Isn't that an irony here? If you put in the work, if you look for wisdom, God will give it to you. It sounds like, well, if I'm doing all this, then why is God giving it to me? Well, that's just the way it works, isn't it? And so often we see this in Scripture. You know, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And then Paul tells us, if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. God gives us opportunities. It's up for us to grasp these opportunities. Now, in your home, you'll have opportunities. Uh, there's natural consequences. There's, there's teachable moments that you'll have to, to teach your kids wisdom. One of the things about Proverbs, though, it also gives us the discipline just to sit down with our kids and say, okay, let's, let's look at this together, kids. Let's take a look at this. Um, God provides opportunities for wisdom. Sometimes it comes with an ouch. <laughs> And it touches stove and ouch, I, I learned not to do that anymore. But sometimes it comes with a discernment, with a prudence, with an insight that says, this is not a good idea. This is not going to turn out well. 
You know, in chapter one, when he talks about peer pressure, oftentimes that's a little voice in our heads, even as young people that says, you know, this is not a good idea. And what Proverbs does is brings that, that little voice and makes it louder and louder, makes it a bigger voice in our head, says, you know what, this is not a good idea. I'm not going that way. And what he says as he continues here, he says, for he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. God does this. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice. And he preserves the way of his godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of unrighteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil and rejoice in the perversity of evil. Let me just stop for a moment to, to kind of focus on what Solomon is reminding us of. He says here that the person who has wisdom, wisdom shields you, he says. It guards you. It preserves you. It keeps you from getting into trouble in your life. People who live with wisdom, we say, man, that guy is so skillful in the way he lives. Look at the, the wisdom he has. And he says that as you do this, as you see it guarding it, wisdom will enter your heart and the knowledge will be a pleasant thing to your soul. You think, man, it's such a good thing that I have this. That's why those who have wisdom want more wisdom. They say, wow, if this, this little bit of wisdom has done me this much good, I, I need more. And so there's discretion here in verse 11. Discretion will guard you to be able to discern which path I should go, which one should I turn to, which is the way to go. You know, discretion is so important. <laughs> Steve Parlow just uh, retired as a mailman. And uh, I'm sure a mailman is happy for the discretion that tells him the difference between a lap dog and a pit bull. <laughs> you know, if you don't know the difference, you're going to be in trouble. Well, life has that thing too. There's some things in life that look so easy, and yet they have such terrible conclusions. And we need to be able to discern the difference between those things. Sometimes uh, parents say no to their kids. When you say no to your kid, is it because you don't want them to be happy? <laughs> of course not. It's that you're trying to protect them. And why is it, though, when God says no, we think that God just doesn't want us to be happy. God is taking all the joyful things out of our life. God does not want you to be unhappy. God wants to protect you. And so he tells us no. He gives us the directions. He's given us insights. He's letting us know what is the best way and what is not the best way. And he points these out. And he says that wisdom will deliver you from three things. The one we already began with here, to deliver you from the way of, of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who lead paths of unrighteousness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil, and rejoice in the perversity of evil, whose paths are crooked, and who are devious in their ways. It's going to keep you from a life of crime, is what he's telling you. It's going to keep you out of jail. You know, they ask kids in a detention center, uh, you know, do you know what it is that brought you here? Why did you in, end up here? You know, why do people end up in jail? Do they understand that? And it's easy, well, you know, I had a rough life. I've been a victim. My parents were terrible. Well, you know, that might be true. You might be a victim and your parents might have been the worst ever. But you have a, uh, you have a choice to respond to that, either in foolishness or in wisdom. You can be foolish and, and do the same things your parents did to you. Or you can be foolish and, and go the path of drugs and alcohol. You can be foolish and do things that are harmful to yourself and others. Or you can be wise and say, look, the choices I'm making right now are really going to affect my future. He says it's going to keep you out of a life of crime if you, if you listen to this. In verses 16 through 19, to deliver you from the strange woman from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they teach the paths of life. 
the problem of sexual immorality. Oh, what a problem today we have with this. The sexual re revolution that started when I was a teenager back in the 60s hasn't gotten much better. It just keeps getting worse and worse. And I hear people say, you know, we don't need to, we, we shouldn't be talking about sex and, and what's right and wrong sex. It's just about we love one another. Well, they're surely making a lot of poor decisions about that. You know, one thing I do like about this text here, you know, this is to keep you from this wicked woman, this strange woman, this adulterous woman, this, this woman who will lure you. And so often we, we place the blame at the foot of women and say, you know what, uh, girls, you have to take lead in this date or the boys will take advantage of you. Scripture never comes at it that way. Scripture comes by saying, Dad, you need to talk to your boys about how to behave themselves sexually how to keep things in their own pants and take care of their own bodies and to not get caught up in this. And look, at it, it, here's the woman who leaves the companion of her youth, <laughs> forgets the covenant with her God, and she just has turmoil after turmoil in her life. I have to confess one of my guilty pleasures is all these court shows. <laughs> I like Judge Judy. I like the people's court. One of the things is, that it, it just seems like it's a, a lesson, life lesson here on what it is to live foolish lives. I mean, how many times? Uh, here's a lady, I, I've got four kids, and uh, and you're living with the father now. Well, I'm living with one of the fathers now. There's four kids by four different men. Oh, my goodness. You know, we talk about, well, I'm a single mom, and, and we know what that means. Uh, and it means it was a man who took advantage of her, I'm sure. But it also means that the child, he, he's he's... You know, this, well, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but the statistics say that he's got a more likely chance of living in poverty himself, more likely chance of having troubles himself. And yet, they don't want to learn this lesson. It says, they'll take it to their grave. They'll sink down to death. Their tracks lead to death. None who go to her return to life, nor do they reach the paths of life. He says, son, this is not the way to live. You're never going to reach your goals that you want if you let yourself get involved in this kind of stuff. If you become the, the baby daddy to all these kids and your income's going out here and there and you never have a relationship with anyone, you'll never find the satisfaction in life that comes with wisdom. Wisdom gives you a satisfaction of life. And then it continues on, verses 20, 21. So you will walk in the way of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. He's telling us <laughs> one of the other things about life. See, wisdom gives you the abilities to uh, escape a life of crime, to escape the, the sexual, sexual traps in, in front of you. And it also, it, he says here, it will give you a good life. It'll help you to be a good person. It, it, it will keep you from messing your life up. Uh, and I, I know of, uh, I know of kids that grew up in the church here, boys and girls that grew up in the church, had so much in front of them. I know some of those who are now in jail. I'm telling you, I know some right now who are in jail, who have been in jail for a long time and will be for a long time. I know one young man who died in jail. Uh, why? Is it because they're of their parents or because of the church or because of the Bible, because of Christianity? No, it was because of their own stubborn choices. They made foolish decisions and followed this way. And he said, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you escape this kind of lifestyle. Two major pitfalls that we've already seen here mentioned in the book of Proverbs. One is uh, bad companions. Uh, you know, he tells us, hey, the urgency of of, of wisdom is don't go with bad companions, peer pressure, chapter one, chapter two here, and the immoral sexual activity. And he's going he's gonna to continue to talk about this more in chapters five and six, and so we'll save it for there. You know, we see some great words that we don't usually use in our day-to-day -day language like prudence and discernment and uh, words like that. And what I would encourage you to do if you're teaching your kids is get a dictionary out. Look up these words. Go over these vocabulary words. There are just so many great words here. Uh, you know, that we, we see. Go over them. Let, let your kids know what these are about. Let them follow these words. You know, I believe that 
Bible study is so important, you know that. But our Bible study is not to turn us into Bible scholars. That's why I've been trying to keep this a little bit light and simple. I'm not going in depth, depth anywhere here. Uh, because we're not to be Bible study, uh, scholars. What he's trying to teach us to be is good people. He's trying to help us to be good Christians, to make good decisions, to know the decisions you make today will have an effect on your future. Man, sometimes when we're young, we just think we know it all. We think we have it all figured out. Uh, you know, that 16-year-old who, who knows it all? And, and uh, you know, Mark Twain told the story of when he was a, a teenager. He said he left home because he couldn't stand living with his father. His father, he said, was the most ignorant man he'd, he'd ever seen. He, he left home when he was 17 years old, and he said he returned when he was 21. He said he was surprised at how much his father had learned in those four years. <laughs> You know, how many of us uh, think we, we have it all worked out? Uh, I think I may have done that. Wisdom calls us to action. It says make a change, make a difference in your life. Uh, when I was going to school, I found out real quick there was a difference in majoring in the Bible and majoring in the will of God. There's one thing to know what the scripture says, it's another thing altogether to apply it to my life and listen to these words. And so he's given us these introductory comments. He, he's not really gotten into the, the heart and the gist of, of why is this? He's just saying, this is why it is so important. Well, I hope you've enjoyed going through chapter two. I hope you're doing well in your isolation there in your homes. I hope you take a, a, an opportunity to sit down with your kids and Study the Bible with them. Look at this yourself. Go over the chapters with them. If, if nothing else, if, if you don't have a whole lot of insights, at least you can read it together. Read chapters one and two. And as you saw as we were going through this, they're pretty self-explanatory. You don't need a PhD in religion. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't need to be a preacher. You don't need an elder in the church. It's pretty simple what he's saying here. Just read it over and you can ask your kids, what, is he, what do you think he's talking about here? And I'm sure your kids can come up with the answer to that. Anyway, I've enjoyed being with you. I hope you have a good week. I'll, I'll see you on Sunday, and then we'll study Proverbs again beginning next week.